in my first talk on Monday, uh, I explained that beauty for von Hildebrand is something metaphysically serious, something life-giving for each human person, and that it must therefore not be written off as something peripheral, something merely pleasant, merely decorative. Beauty must not, I uh, showed in von Hildebrand, be sacrificed to the demands of utilitarian civilization. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every beautiful thing in nature and in art. So I argued. Um, then on Tuesday, Dr. Vanish picked up the theme of the objectivity of beauty and some of the Hildebrandian responses to the subjectivization of beauty. Now, my topic today, which continues the, um, the reflection of the week, uh, is the transcendence of beauty. That sounds vague, uh, but the title, in fact, refers to a very definite idea in von Hildebrand found in chapters six and nine of his aesthetics and included in the packet of readings. I assume I'm being heard all the way in the back. I'm never quite sure. Give me a signal if I um, drift away or lose the connection. In these chapters, uh, von Hildebrand explores a certain mysterious feature of the beauty of many visible and audible things. And he regarded this train of thought as his most important single contribution to aesthetics. And so now I'll try to explain it to you as I understand it and hopefully help you in your reading of those chapters. Dr. Vanish already covered some of the ground, but uh, I think if I cover it now in my own way, it will become uh, clearer to you. At the same time, um, besides understanding von Hildebrand, we're looking for points of contact between the phenomenological aesthetics of von Hildebrand and the theological aesthetics of Urs von Balthasar. Uh, uh, and therefore, we have with us David Schindler, an authority on the thought of von Balthasar. Uh, I'll let him tell us whether anything I found here in von Hildebrand makes for a significant connection with von Balthasar. All right, <clears throat> we've already gotten acquainted with Hildebrandian value. Um, I discussed it, Dr. Venish discussed it. Let me just remind you that Hildebrandian value is not the product of anyone's act of valuing. Rather, he understands it as an excellence, a dignity inherent in a being prior to anyone's act of valuing. Uh, there's a wonderful line in Troilus and Cressida of Shakespeare that expresses uh, just this point, if I'm remembering it rightly, uh, it goes like this, but value dwells not in particular will. It holds his estimate and dignity wherein tis precious of itself as in the prizer. So that idea of something precious of itself is uh, the Hildebrandian notion of value. And that shows, by the way, that the term value is not just a term for economics. Already in Shakespeare, it was used in just this Hildebrandian sense. Now, <clears throat> I remind you of this notion of value in von Hildebrand because beauty and value, as we'll see, are very intimately connected. Now, I want to... Um, try to understand with you this fundamental division that von Hildebrand makes 
within the sphere of beauty. Uh, he speaks on the one hand of metaphysical beauty, and on the other hand of the beauty of visible and audible things. Dr. Vanish, as I say, discussed this yesterday, um, and I'll try to um, amplify uh, what he already said. Now, our focus here is primarily on the beauty of certain visible and audible things, but we have to understand the contrast uh, with metaphysical beauty, so I start with that, with metaphysical beauty. And I start with an, a revealing example taken from von Hildebrand's work, The Nature of Love. He argues there that in loving a person, I take that person under the aspect of beauty. He speaks in the German text of the Gesamtschönheit of the beloved person, the overall individual beauty of the beloved person. And he's simply affirming a connection between love and beauty that was already known to Plato. Now, where does this beauty of the beloved person come from? Von Hildebrand answers like this. As I come to know the beloved person, I discover a being of inexpressible value in her. Something in the Shakespeare expression, precious of itself. This value gives off a radiance or splendor that we call beauty. And it is this beauty that awakens my love. Here you have metaphysical beauty in the sense of Van Hildebrand, the radiance or splendor of some value. Whenever something of value gives off a kind of radiance or splendor so as to make itself lovable to us, it displays metaphysical value, excuse me, metaphysical beauty in his sense. Now, notice that in loving uh, another person, I don't exactly love the beauty of the other as if the other were a work of art. I love the other person. My love is not an aesthetic experience such as I have in relation to a work of art, but it is sustained by the encounter with the beauty in the other. That is somehow the thing that specifically engenders the love. We'll take another uh, example of metaphysical beauty. Take the uh, love of neighbor uh, practiced and lived by Mother Teresa of Calcutta. So here we have a, an heroic moral goodness. It too gives off a certain radiance of beauty whenever we feel a loving admiration uh, for Mother Teresa's love of neighbor or anyone's heroic goodness. We are registering and being responsive to the beauty of that person. So this is metaphysical beauty in von Hildebrand's sense, a beauty growing out of some value so as to awaken love. I could give you a more modest example uh, of uh, this metaphysical beauty. Just take the beauty proper to any living thing, the excellence of a being that is alive and self-constituting. I think of that wonderful characterization of living being in the philosophical biology of Hans Jonas the excellence of being alive and self-constituting, well, it's not in the first place an aesthetic value, but through the radiance of this value of life, there arises a certain beauty proper to any living thing. And I'd have you notice uh, uh, something about all my examples so far offered for metaphysical beauty, not one of them is taken from the world of art. 
And I say that simply because our focus in the seminar has been almost exclusively on beauty in architecture, theater, drama. Uh, but when we in this seminar speak of the rehabilitation of beauty, we in no way confine ourselves to uh, the beauty as it is achieved in art. Uh, it's a vaster human reality, uh, beauty, and we mean to uh, take our subject uh, in its fullness. So, <clears throat> every value uh, in Van Hildebrand has some radiance of beauty. This is very revealing for Van Hildebrand's concept of value. All value has this proximity to beauty. And when you read Van Hildebrand saying value is not just something beneficial for a person, but something important in, him, in itself, he is stressing this moment of radiance and splendor. So all value, by its very nature, has an aesthetic dimension. This is metaphysical beauty, the beauty dimension of any and every value. Now, let's bring in for contrast the beauty of visible and audible form. Take, for instance, the beauty of a circle. Uh, it has, in contrast to a totally irregular line that encloses a space, the circle has a certain distinct beauty, or a perfectly formed hand, or face, or the singing of a bird. Um, these visible and audible uh, things have their own beauty, but it is not, von Hildebrand argues, a metaphysical beauty. It is rather a beauty that attaches directly to the visible and audible form. It's not the fragrance of some underlying value. It's not as if in the circle there were some deeper value, the fragrance of which is the beauty of it. Here we have a kind of beauty that we naturally call aesthetic, uh, attaching directly to the visible and audible thing. So <clears throat> with visible and audible uh, things, you, the, the aesthetic value may be the only value. Uh, whereas with uh, metaphysical beauty, uh, the, uh, the beauty is always the radiance of some underlying value. Uh, but the aesthetic value can stand alone being the only value proper to the visible and audible thing. The beauty adhering directly to the visible or audible form. Now, um, I gave the example of the um, beautifully, f perfectly formed face. Uh, and we have to here be careful not to slide back into metaphysical beauty. If a face is, let's say, expressive of intelligence, a very intelligent face, uh, then there's inner life being expressed, uh, and the beauty uh, will be a kind of radiance of, of that inner excellence. So um, we have to, in order to get the uh, beauty of visible and audible in this sense of aesthetic value, we have to take a human face prior to any expression of inner life. So we may find in a healthy, undamaged, well-proportioned uh, uh, face an aesthetic value uh, that is not a matter of metaphysical value. Uh, some uh, argue, uh, uh, as von Hildebrand notes, that um, beauty really is limited to aesthetic value. Uh, that this is the whole sphere of beauty, this domain of uh, the aesthetic value of visible and audible things. But von Hildebrand strenuously protests saying, don't overlook the vast domain of metaphysical 
value that has a different structure as beauty and uh, is all important for any account of the beauty of the world. Well, now we are in a position to identify the mystery of beauty that von Hildebrand claims to find within the beauty of visible and audible form, or of certain visible and audible forms. In some cases, the beauty of a visible or audible form exceeds, surpasses the form in the most mysterious way. For example, there are compositions of light, shade, color, leaves that, seen from a certain place, have a breathtaking beauty. Sometimes the afternoon sun breaks into a shaded enclosed area, lighting up from behind the leaves and creating just such a composition. Von Hildebrand says the aesthetic beauty far exceeds the bearer. By bearer, he means those lights and shades and colors and the composition of them which displays the beauty. So he's struck by a, a disproportion between the modest reality of the bearer and the breathtaking power of the beauty that appears in that bearer. This is different uh, from the aesthetic beauty of the circle. Uh, the beauty of the circle is understandably the beauty of the circle. It grows out of the circle, though not in the way of metaphysical beauty. But it is a beauty that is at least proportioned to the bearer, namely the circle, and expressive of the circle. And we understand why when that line that makes the circle gets jagged and disrupted, the beauty proper to the circle is compromised. We're not puzzled uh, why such beauty can appear in the circle, but with the compositions in nature just described, we are puzzled because the beauty so far surpasses the play of light and shadow and color in which it appears. The same uh, is true of a glorious sunset, uh, the uh, breathtaking, uh, awe-inspiring beauty seems mysteriously out of proportion to the modest physical bearer of it. That's what catches von Hildebrand's attention in this discussion. And so we get this language, uh, you noticed it in reading, the beauty of the first power. That's the aesthetic beauty proportioned to the bearer, like the beauty of the circle. And the beauty of second power, where the beauty seems all out of proportion to the modest ontological makeup of the bearer. Now, this uh, astonishing, mysterious thing that uh, von Hildebrand has in mind is perhaps clearest of all in the case of music. And so here, for the first time, uh, beauty and art enters into the scope of my discussion. How, von Hildebrand asks, can a few notes arranged in a certain way constitute a melody having the unearthly beauty that we experience in certain melodies? Why is it that by changing just one note a little bit, the melody is lost and the apparition of beauty vanishes? Von Hildebrand makes the interesting observation that for such beauty as we experience in that heart-rending melody, for such beauty to exist in the manner of metaphysical beauty, you would need 
the greatest virtue or holiness in the bearer, the radiance of which would be the beauty. How is it that beauty can dispense with these higher spiritual things like virtue and holiness and can appear in a few poor audible notes that constitute the melody? He says there's no intelligible proportion between the notes of the melody and the unearthly, haunting beauty that appears in them. This is the mysterious beauty that von Hildebrand wants us to marvel at. And I uh, uh, would like to bring in here uh, the wonderful, wonderful passage of John Henry Newman that von Hildebrand always uh, made reference to in this connection that expresses, and I must say, better even than von Hildebrand can uh, uh, what is meant. So let me uh, just share a few sentences from this memorable passage in Newman uh, that targets exactly this aesthetic mystery uh, that concerns von Hildebrand. So in one of his university discourses, uh, Newman says, there are seven notes in the scale, make them 14. Yet, what a slender outfit for so vast an enterprise. What science brings so much out of so little? Out of what poor elements does some great master in it create his new world? Shall we say that all this exuberant inventiveness is a mere ingenuity or trick of art, like some game or fashion of the day without reality, without meaning? Is it possible that that inexhaustible evolution and disposition of notes, so rich, yet so simple, so intricate, yet so regulated, so various, yet so majestic, should be a mere sound which is gone and perishes? Can it be that these mysterious stirrings of heart and keen emotions and strange yearnings after we know not what and awful impressions from we know not whence should be wrought in us by what is unsubstantial and comes and goes and begins and ends in itself? It is not so. It cannot be. No, they, the notes of the music, have escaped from some higher sphere. They are the outpourings of eternal harmony in the medium of created sound. They are echoes from our home. They are the voice of angels or the Magnificat of saints or the living laws of divine governance or the divine attributes. Something are they besides themselves which we cannot compass, which we cannot utter, though mortal man. And he, perhaps not otherwise distinguished above his fellows, has the gift of eliciting them and of that quote. Note that Newman is not assuming that uh, the mysterious music of which he speaks is thematically sacred or distinctly liturgical. Uh, it, uh, 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 a heavenly melody in a song of Schubert or in the Finlandia of Sibelius uh, quite uh, suffices to uh, give us a good example of this, um, this intimation of a higher world that von Hildebrand discerns in uh, some aesthetic beauty, certain visible and audible uh, things. Perhaps the uh, notion of 
the sublime, which Dr. Wood introduced in connection with Kant, uh, could fit here. Uh, not that I'm taking it in the full technical Kantian sense, but there is something distinctly sublime about this beauty of the second power that uh, is full of this mysterious transcendence. Now, von Hildebrand um, discusses two ways of evading this mystery. Uh, and the first uh, is uh, spoken in a kind of platonic spirit and says, look, the bodily senses belong to a lower part of man, um, they can't, they can't contact uh, something higher and otherworldly. Uh, they function at a much lower level. And therefore, uh, this uh, beauty of which von Hildebrand speaks must be illusory. The senses just can't uh, mediate to us that uh, kind of beauty. And so um, this mysterious beauty gets explained away. Uh, it can't be, given the inherent limitation of the senses, so one says in a platonic setting. And von Hildebrand responds um, uh, eminently in the spirit of phenomenology when he says, I don't understand how it's possible that through what I hear, uh, this mysterious other world opens to me, but it's an undeniable given of experience. And for von Hildebrand, it is a capital sin against phenomenology to refuse to acknowledge something unmistakably given just on the grounds that I can't explain how that given thing coheres with something else. That's a kind of bad unphenomenological rationalism. So von Hildebrand says, let's just live with this mystery, but not fail uh, to take in uh, and fully acknowledge this transcendent beauty. And the other second objection that he um, uh, deals with is, you might say, uh, a, a kind of unhelpful theological uh, explanation. So he says that once in discussing this issue with a theologian, um, and they were talking about the uh, beauty uh, that can be seen in the mountains under certain conditions of light, the theologian said, look, um, the mountains uh, remind the viewer of the immensity of God. And so thinking of that divine immensity, uh, on the occasion of seeing the mountains, you get this sense of a kind of otherworldly beauty. So the uh, theologian is, in effect, reducing the, um, uh, this, this, this beauty of second power, reducing it back to metaphysical beauty. He's saying, no, we can find some reality, in this case, the reality of God, the radiance of which is the beauty. And von Hildebrand again protests on phenomenological grounds, saying, but you don't have to entertain any theological concept, not even implicitly, in order to uh, perceive this mysterious transcendence of the beauty of second power. It doesn't have to be and is typically not mediated by some theological thought that you insert into your aesthetic experience. And so he uh, resists either explaining away this beauty of second power by saying platonically, well, it shouldn't exist, or he resists equally reducing this uh, mysterious beauty to a kind of metaphysical beauty. Now, <clears throat> in order to think about uh, what he's found here with the um, uh, beauty of second power in visible and audible, uh, he brings in uh, 
an interesting analogy. He searches for all kinds of analogies and drops most of them. But there's one analogy that he, in the end, finds helpful. Uh, uh, and that is the analogy with the sacraments uh, in the Catholic sense, and especially baptism. Uh, so he says that in the case of baptism, you've got just physical water. Um, and the pouring of it, uh, and in the name of the Trinity, that affects the baptism, affects the regeneration of the baptized person in Christ. What a disproportion between physical water and a spiritual cleansing. Uh, and, and that, he says, that's somehow analogous to uh, the beauty of second power, where these modest earthly elements available to the senses, in fact, mediate to us this unearthly uh, beauty. So uh, he it doesn't say it's exactly the same in the case of baptism. You've got a divine ordinance, at least in Catholic belief, um, that Christ has attached this regeneration to the pouring of water. And, and so we understand, at least, uh, how the higher and the lower get connected in the case of baptism. But uh, in Van Hildebrand says, uh, there's something there in this beauty of second power, there must be something that does the work of that divine ordinance that connects physical and spiritual cleansing. But we don't know what it is. It's not known to us. And, and therein lies this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this inalienable mystery of the uh, beauty, this beauty of second power. I, I tend to agree with Dr. Vanish, who uh, 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 said yesterday that the title of Van Hildebrand's chapter 9 is The Solution of the Riddle of the Beauty of Second Power. And I think it's not really a solution he offers. Um, he clarifies what he means with this analogy, with the sacraments. Uh, and he mainly appeals uh, to respect what's unmistakably given, not rationalistically explain it away. But that's not solving the riddle, it's just identifying it, pointing it out uh, with great precision. Now, coming to um, a conclusion, let me try to uh, sum up uh, the significance of this aesthetic insight of von Hildebrand. And I, um, uh, well, I have a number of points, and maybe um, there are others that you will bring out in the discussion that I've overlooked. First of all, um, it follows, if his analysis is right, that the bodily senses uh, have uh, an amazing, unsuspected spiritual capacity. Um, if we get beyond that platonic depreciation of the senses and, and take in what's given here with this beauty of second power, one sees the, uh, an incredible capacity to register what's highest and even somehow unearthly uh, through the bodily senses. Uh, another point of great significance is that this beauty of second power is what Peter Berger called, um, in a famous book of his, his years ago, a signal of transcendence. Berger was talking about how in our secularized world we desperately need signals of transcendence, intimations of something beyond the imminent, um, uh, this worldly setting uh, in which we exist. And so if there's any merit to von Hildebrand's analysis, uh, 
you have here in this beauty of second power a, a, a very significant signal of transcendence. Um, not, of course, a proof, um, but still not nothing, an intimation. Uh, for those who are sensitive to it, um, perhaps a very strong and compelling signal of transcendence. Also important in this train of thought in von Hildebrand is, I think, um, a certain sense of mystery that it leaves us with. It's always good to push back against the natural rationalism of the human mind and to identify uh, a wonder, a mirandum, here in our experience of beauty uh, that defies all uh, explanation, uh, that inflicts, you might say, a salutary sense of our finitude on us. Another point of significance in the uh, analysis of uh, von Hildebrand is that, you know, in my first talk I addressed that question, is beauty just a thing of decoration, ornamentation? Well, if we're dealing with this beauty of second power, we're dealing with something of an ultimate seriousness, something that should not just be overruled by the demands of utilitarian civilization, something much more um, significant than decoration. And in that first talk, I also raised the issue of aestheticism and tried to explain why not all interest in taking seriously of beauty is aestheticism. Clearly, if it's this beauty of second power, uh, then uh, that aestheticist self-indulgence that I described has no place. We expose ourselves to a mysterious uplift of the spirit uh, and that self-absorbed uh, uh, stance of the aestheticist is entirely surpassed by one who really drinks in this experience of beauty of the second power. Another uh, consequence uh, of this is uh, that uh, beauty, uh, after all, has a claim on the Christian. Now, uh, in his essay, Beauty in the Light of the Redemption, von Hildebrand is dealing with those who say that uh, beauty is uh, something too, uh, too much in the order of a luxury to have any claim on the heart of a Christian. But if we are dealing with this beauty of second power, we're dealing with something that can lend a deep experiential support to our religious commitment, something that awakens aspirations for a higher world of glory. How can that fail to have a very legitimate claim on the heart of the Christian? And yet another consequence following from von Hildebrand's um, uh, focus on this aesthetic mystery, uh, I see here a certain argument against uh, aesthetic subjectivism. Uh, that idea that the beauty is just in the eye of the beholder or projected by us out of our feelings into the beautiful thing. Uh, whoever experiences deeply this beauty of second power has the sense of something breaking in from above, not something erupting in us and being projected into uh, what we experience but rather something speaking to us from above through these visible and audible uh, things of beauty so that um, one can, I think, develop 
uh, the response to aesthetic subjectivism with special reference to this um, mysterious kind of beauty. So that's um, the thought in von Hildebrand uh, that I wanted to um, uh, share with you. It's uh, maybe um, a little more philosophical heavy lifting than we've had in uh, some of the other talks, but if you follow me, I think you'll, and follow von Hildebrand, find something very enriching for your own uh, understanding of and experience of beauty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.